closer to zero. Then <laughs> unmute, unmute and we'll get the show going. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I think we are going live right now, Michael. So um, if we're live, welcome everybody. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. In about four minutes, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just hang out and chat with us here for a few minutes while people jump on the stream. We want to welcome everybody to live design. We see we have some people in the chat. Let us know where you're from. We see uh, we have Eric Beatty's already there in chat. We had uh, Hamza Ob Abo Omar. Sorry if I uh, did not say that name correctly. Omar Kog. Man, some of these names are really hard for me to pronounce. <laughs> Uh, I really apologize for that. But welcome, everybody, to uh, SolidWorks Live Design. So Michael and I are just having a chat. We're talking about simulation today. We're talking about the material properties of Veskar, uh, Veskar the metal, but also Veskar armor. So Michael, you just gave a warning. You were saying we should give a warning. If nobody wants any spoilers, maybe they should mute us until 11 a.m. Eastern. Right. So I mean, but there's a countdown on the screen. We're going to probably reveal some spoilers. If you have not watched Mandalorian, you might want to mute the broadcast and then <laughs> unmute when you see that timer getting closer to zero. So when we start our presentation and get into <laughs> the simulation domain of 3D experience works, uh, th that's when you know what you'll need to unmute. But if if you want to join us in the conversation on Mandalorian and Beskar and the material properties and kind of theorizing how well it would perform under different conditions, then please join us. So, Michael, I was wondering, you know, you're a simulation guy. Uh, you know, we see in the Mandalorian, Veskar's, you know, it's resilient even almost to like lightsaber weaponry. So how does Jango Fett get uh, basically uh, eliminated in the Clone Wars, uh, you know, when we watched that in episode, I, I think, two or three. You were saying the purity of the metal might have something to do with it, right? Well, so I, th I think there's two factors. There's the factor of the Jedi, and then there's definitely the factor of the material. I mean, the, the precision of a lightsaber strike could go right between, you know, the, the Beskar armor. That's that's maybe maybe uh, maybe he's that good. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it could be. The other but there's one other is... things. There's other things that confuse me. So we see uh, Boba's armor back. I can see it in your camera up there. He's got it painted, and we saw the other Mandos. They had some blue paint on their armor. But I know, like when working with metal finishes, you have to really, you have to make that surface kind of abrasive enough to take a primer or a paint to it. But we see Mando's armor is like perfectly shiny. Like, how do they sand Veskar armor to to be able to take a primer? That one's beyond me. You'd have to ask the the forger. I think is is their their role, their title, the armor. Their, yeah, uh, yeah. As 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 they create and forge those pieces of armor. But it, it, coming back to you know, can it withstand a lightsaber strike? I mean, it's all about the the purity. You know, the percentage of Veskar yeah. that's that's in there. Of, and how resilient it is to a, a lightsaber. So, like with it going back to like you know Jango Fett and his untimely doom, of um, you know if it did come in contact with the Beskar, maybe maybe that armor wasn't uh, pure Beskar. Ooh, interesting. Hey, so question for the chat: Has anybody in SolidWorks ever tried to? figure out the material properties for Veskar steel, like, you know, the Poison ratio, the elastic modularity, like, I'd love to know if anybody's done that. I so, think you call it a rigid, rig, just make it a rigid body. Like, just, just, just make it, just make it a good instead. <laughs> it's impervious. Well, we are at the top of the hour, Michael. I think it's time for us to get started. Welcome, everybody, to SolidWorks Live Design. We have a great episode here today. We're joined by Michael Steves, who's going to show us some really cool stuff in simulation. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be back. I know I did live design last year. I did two things. I did, you know, design and make your own growth chart. So I think that the big takeaway from that episode was how you can take something that's you know large format that you've designed and lay it out at home using your home office printer. So we did this 
large design, a growth chart. I mean, I think it's like six feet tall. How can I take a design in SolidWorks and you know trace out the design onto that board? So we did the design in SolidWorks. We printed it out um, on eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper. So and taped them together, and we're able to you know trace that out to create a custom design. And with my design, it was the Space Needle because I'm in the Pacific Northwest. Um, my kids were born in Seattle, so it was a great, great way to uh, kind of track how they grow over the years and, and show off, you know, not only some cool sketching tools, but also also how you can export some of this data to, you know, in, in non-traditional ways, like to, you know, multi-sheets of paper in, in one print. So that was a pretty couple fun challenges that we did there. The other one was apps for kids. So I did a, a second session on that. I'm um, going over one of the lessons that I've taught uh, with apps for kids, making something that moves. I mean, we, I had students make uh, some llamas, some airplanes, and a crab. We went through the crab example in the live design um, and head over to swappsforkids.com. Great place to get started um, and learn about what it can do and also share it with, uh, with your kids and your friends and family so that they can get their skills in 3D modeling early. All right. So if you want to go back and watch any of those previous episodes, we have a playlist on our YouTube channel with all the SolidWorks live design episodes from 2020. You may notice on our channel this year, we've started a new playlist for SolidWorks live design in 2021. Keep in mind, we're going to be bringing this broadcast to you every two weeks. Uh, and we'll, at the end of the uh, at the end of this show, we'll talk about the next episode coming up. But Michael, I think it's time we dive in. You're going to show us. Simulation is probably the number one requested thing we get asked to talk about. Show examples of simulation. And you are the man when it comes to, solid, to simulation. Thanks, Jeremy. And you've covered a little bit of what we're going to get into today in a previous episode of SolidWorks Live. You're talking about the shredder, the DTV yeah. shredder, dual track vehicle shredder, just tearing up the ATV industry. I mean, okay, Jeremy, have you ridden a skateboard? Um, yes, it did not end very well. <laughs> what? So, so, so you may not want to take essentially a, a tank <laughs> and strap it to the bottom of that skateboard. <laughs> well, Does maybe, wait, 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 sound... maybe, maybe if you put handlebars on it, then you'll be able to have a little, a little bit more confidence. I don't know, Michael. You see, I have a scar right here under my lip. This yeah. this does not sound like it's going to end very well for me. Uh, we'll make sure you wear the proper uh, protection equipment this time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I know, I've, I've got uh, some really cool renderings up here. Compliments to my uh, coworker colleague, Mike Sandy. I think he's going to get into some some rendering things um, in, the, in the future here. But this is the, the DTV shredder. Um, as you can see there, you can recognize the kind of the skateboard element that's there. You see the track um, underneath the dual track. There's one on the other side and then the, the handlebar uh, that's that's there. And that controls, you know, your your amount of uh, the gas uh, your, that you're that you're putting onto the, the engine uh, that's inside. So how, you know, one question that we're going to answer is how do you steer this? But just taking a look at some of the other views here, you know, we've got this really cool you know, complex suspension system that's going on there. This was actually one of my favorite demos that we did uh, two years ago, uh, showcasing flexible components and being able to insert multiple instances of component components and making them independently flexible. Uh, so that was a really cool use of, of the DTV um, in that case. Here's a cut through slice where you can start to see some of the internal components of what's going on here. And actually, if you look kind of in this rear region there's this uh, cylinder these cylindrical faces that are going on here we're going to focus kind of in that area and also you know how the skateboard essentially that where your feet go how that mounts to and how that controls the steering of the of the shredder so what else we got here we got kind of this really cool cut through slice from the top uh, you start to see some of those components in the back, and we're going to dig into this in a little bit, but here's here's one of the other mechanisms that we're going to really focus on today. Uh, this is the, the steering tilt. So on the top of this, this is where that skateboard mounts on the base. That's what mounts to the frame. And Jeremy, you see those little holes on the, the far region 
in that cylindrical disc over here? Yeah, yeah. So this is what connects to um, a push rod, which controls the amount of power that is distributed to either the left track or the right track. So, so hold on a second, Michael. You're telling me when you lean on that skateboard, a push rod is basically controlling the throttle for either track and that's how it's like giving it gas to either side just by leaning from side to side? That's right. So taking another look at this here, there's that same little you know, sub-assembly for our, our tilt. And you can see how it's connected over to this tie rod. We've got a push rod here that's controlling the power distribution um, out to that, that motor or out from the motor into those two tracks. Wow, that's really cool. Hey, really quick while you're right here, Michael, I just want to give a big shout out to chat. Welcome, everybody. I'm seeing a lot of people jump on. Um, hey, JJ uh, Palacio from Colombia, welcome. Nikhil, welcome. Amar. Uh, Jan, welcome all you guys. Really, really glad to see everybody in the chat. If you have any questions while we're going on, make sure you uh, comment. We're watching the chat kind of live. I'll be interrupting Michael while he's uh, kind of going through this to uh, ask any questions you guys might have. Sorry, Michael. Go ahead. All good. So we're going to start digging into this, and I'm going to just switch over to SolidWorks here because this is where we've you know designed uh, the DTV shredder. That's where we're going to focus uh, for this this tilt mechanism. So Let's jump over to SolidWorks Connected, take a closer look at some of these components, um, because this is uh, where, this is, you know, the question of that tilt. We, we've talked about how it controls the, the steering or how much power is going to the different tracks, but what is the feedback to the user? And we have this rubber block that's in there. How does that influence the comfort of the rider? Because right, you could imagine if you're just on a skateboard with very loose trucks, you could easily just fall off the thing. What kind of feedback or force feedback can we give to the user as they lean more on that skateboard? How much is pushing against them? Right. And if you lean the other way, so you can, of course, probably you can e even interchange these blocks with a block that's built for you. So you can really make this customizable uh, to give that level of resistance that you want in your riding experience. Yeah, so that's really cool. This simple part is basically going to define how hard you have to lean one way or the other, basically, to control how much it's going to turn. That's right. So we've uh, so we're going to start out with just if this was just a rubber block with a hole in it, because there is a bolt that's in there uh, that's controlling, you know, the the pivot rotation for the rest of those components. But with this rubber material, I mean, it, okay, we could change material properties. Right, when we were talking about this, the strength of best guard, it's like, okay, what are the, me the mechanical properties? What are the material properties of that? Well, we can control that, right? When we do a simulation, we can also change the geometry. So that's the other thing we're going to explore today. And so I have some alternative designs here that we're going to explore. We're actually gonna take a look at this one, Alt-2 and Alt-3 and how they perform in that in that mechanism and what force you know feedback does it provide to the user so what we're going to do today is show how you can create that study we'll get into some of the results actually i'm gonna i'm gonna let me switch over here real quick because you saw maybe the the setup of um of you know uh, some of the advertisements for the session today i did try to tease a little bit of the, some of the simulation results what we were going to see um, but here again we're back in our web browser we're using um, the physics simulation review app and this is where we can start to kind of understand, you know, how this is going to behave when this tilts over. So obviously you can see it kind of squishes there, but you may want to ask, well, what kind of stresses, what the, what's the strain that's seen in that rubber material? Um, and we can do this right from a web browser. So <laughs> this is great for, for sharing and, you know, collaborating on these simulation results. As you may have, if you're creating these simulation results and sharing with other team members, great way to do this. Uh, right inside a web browser. Whoa, 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 hold on. So I don't need the software you use to create the simulation if I wanted to view these results. You could just send me these to me in a web browser and I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to have SolidWorks or Simulia or anything like that. I could just view it in the browser. Correct. Yep, you yeah. just jump onto um, the platform. You'd have the 
a simulation collaborator role. That gives you the physics simulation review app that we're using here. And what there's this other app, and I know we've, we've talked about it before in previous episodes. We also talk about it on Exploring 3D Experience Works Live. Um, but with the physics simulation review app, you can go a few steps further actually to understand this. So if, if you're talking with other simulation people, like you know, hopefully who we're talking to today, um, is you might be interested in you know the mesh. We're going to talk about the mesh today, and sure enough, you know the mesh quality. Green is good, red is bad, yellow is yeah, it can be better. <laughs> so sure enough, <laughs> I've got a couple areas in my mesh that that are yellow. Um, and if I look at the details of here, you know, it just gives me the, the the quantities of how many good elements I have, poor elements, bad elements, you know, what kind of connections are in there, you know, how many nodes are we solving for, and that those type of details. So again, the simulation review app here, right from your web browser, you're able to dig into this. We can even view the material layout. So right there, you can see, you know, for uh, the steel components, we've got a permanent mold cast. And then for um, that rubber block, we've got a custom um, material there. Some Mooney Rivlin, you know, rubber material properties. Uh, you said yeah. you said custom materials. This does mean that we <laughs> could put Vescar in here if we knew that had the material properties, right? Yeah, I'm just wondering how we we there there is we do have a uh, material calibration app um available as well we just need to get some testing data from somewhere well hey look if i look at the chat right now uh philippe solis just joined in from costa rica saying that he's a, a materials engineering student philippe i'm going to ask you could you figure out the material properties of vescar metal we've been wondering about this since we started the show really curious as a materials engineering student if that's something you might have any insight to We'll see. All right, so, <laughs> all right, you can you can understand kind of more of the setup that's going on here. And um, while this may not be, you know, obvious the first time looking at it, getting a little bit of an understanding here, it's pretty easy. So we're actually rotating the top here and we're holding some, you know, rotational display, uh, displacements there along that, that bolt hole. So that's a, the setup that we did here today. That's what I'm gonna go through and show you how that's done. And then uh, we'll take a closer look at, at some of these results here. Let me switch over to you know, one of the other results here and take a look at the strain. You know, of course, you can hide and show components, just make it easier to understand what's going on inside. So a really cool way to do this. Um, let's jump back over to, um, let's see. I already have the setups and run. We'll toggle back to that in a moment. But the, one of the big ideas that I want to get out there is, you know, this design was done in SolidWorks and how are we getting it over to these Simulia, which is a sister brand of SolidWorks, these Simulia uh, roles and apps. And we're doing it with the 3D Experience platform. So we're able to just natively open up uh, the assembly and inside some of these other apps and, and get going. So and this could be if you're already a SOLIDWORKS customer, you can connect it to the 3D Experience platform. There's also the 3D Experience SOLIDWORKS offers that are built on the 3D Experience platform. That's what I'm using here today. Uh, lastly, um, you could just get some of these Simulia roles um, you know, that provides this level of technology to do these simulations. Um, and you're actually able to import you know, 3D CAD models. If it's a SOLIDWORKS model or if, it, if it's from somewhere else, uh, you're able to open those up um, directly inside those other apps and perform those simulation studies. So it's very flexible depending on how you wanna work and depending on the tools that are available to you. So Jeremy, you know, we both used SOLIDWORKS simulation before, you know, integrated right into the SOLIDWORKS CAD tool, um, but we're going, you know, a, a number of steps further in terms of the types of physics that we're solving here. So to, you know, we're, we're leveraging the Simulia technology uh, that we've talked about already, but to get there is actually really easy. So what I can do is just select, you know, my component of interest. We're gonna start with our whole assembly. We'll head over to the compass. There you can see a bunch of the roles that I have. Um, but here's some of my favorite apps. We're gonna use the Mechanical Scenario Creation app to, to get started. So this actually just launches it 
directly from SolidWorks and brings it over to um, the 3D Experience app that I have open. So while that's pulling up there, you can see the one that um, we have, I've already solved, and you can see all those different rear truck FEMs on the left-hand side. Uh, those are some of the things that are new and different, um, especially if you've used SolidWorks simulation before. So one of the other hold big on, takeaways Hold on, here, hold on, Michael, Michael. Yeah. So you didn't have to go like uh, launch your app or anything. You can just do that right from it with inside of SolidWorks. Right from SolidWorks. So I want to know where was it when you showed it? I was expecting boom. Where was the boom? That's pretty cool, Michael. That was so. That's so easy. Like think about it. How many times are people like, where's that app? And the good news is, is at least in Windows 10, you can just search for your apps, but you never even had to leave SolidWorks. You could just go over there, click the button. So can I do that with other apps too, like that I might have? Is that how they all work? That's right. Especially when we're leveraging the, the 3D model. Like if we've done it in SolidWorks, we have that model active in SolidWorks. I can reuse, repurpose, leverage, that same model in other apps throughout the platform. So in that sense, the 3D Experience platform is integrated right in. It makes it really easy to just launch those apps. And then since that's the active model that you're working with, that's the one that it pulls right in to continue that work you know, right into the next step. Boom. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> So the this in you thought that was easy. Well, we're if okay. I, let me just take another moment. Just talk just a couple more seconds about Simulia. Leading technology when it comes to finite element analysis software. I mean, you've heard of Abacus. I have. It's like the best simulation software in the world, from what I've been told, right? And we're not talking about you know doing little map, you know, algebra. We're, we're talking about finite element analysis, yeah. you know, strengths of materials. We're talking about structural analysis, we're talking about thermal. We, you know, there's even some CFD um, in there. And we're, we're expanding the Simulia portfolio as well with electromagnetics. So there's a lot of things that you can do with this uh, Simulia technology. Right now, we're just focusing on structural. So maybe in a future event, we can we can get into some other things. Actually, I do have a, an event coming up uh, a few sessions from now where we're going to be talking about fatigue and the durability of materials. So that'll be an, another exciting session to, that I'll be back doing. I'm really interested in uh, the electromagnetic side of things. Uh, I'm going completely off topic. One of my favorite episodes of Mythbusters ever was where they looked at whether or not cell phone the electromagnetics from cell phones actually interfered with airplane avionics. It's like my favorite episode ever. I'd love, I imagine if they had these type of simulation tools back when they did the Mythbusters episode, right? It wouldn't be as fun. <laughs> like it would be, it would be fun, but there's just such an emotional payoff when like you actually destroy yeah. and do stuff in the physical world. This is true. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> but we can take those lessons, apply them virtually. So that, you know, it's less time less effort, you can do more things in less time in the virtual world using unlimited recycled electrons. <laughs> All right. All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt on that one. All right. So taking a look back here, you know, the, the first thing that I'm prompted with is to create an analysis case. What kind of case do I want to make today? Is it going to be structural, thermal, or is it going to be a you know combination of thermal and structural? In this case, we're just, just doing structural, so I'll hit OK. And a couple things to notice um, in addition here. On the left-hand side, we have our model tree, or actually simulation tree. And if I collapse this down, uh, there's three primary areas. There's the model, there's the scenario, and our results. So in the model and scenario, this is where we're doing our post-processing, or excuse me, our pre-processing, you know, to set up the materials, set up the uh, mesh, set up the boundary conditions. We're then going to solve and then process the results uh, in, in that results section. The other thing to notice here on the right hand side is we have an assistant. So this is actually what really makes it easy to kind of walk through the setup process because it's asking the questions for us um, to properly set this up um, to, to execute. And it also lets us know if we've done something poorly uh, that needs to be corrected. So one of the first steps here, you know, it, 
you know, I'm, I've come, I'm coming from SolidWorks simulation where you, you set up the materials, you set up the uh, boundary conditions, and then you mesh and run. Well, here, the, the workflow is a little bit different, but again, the assistant helps us along here. So one of the first steps here is we need to create a finite element model. This also, you know, forces us to limit what exactly are we solving in terms of the number of components. So let's actually um, go through this step here. Uh, so you can understand a little bit about you know the meshing that's going on and also start to see some of the structure that's happening too because in this rear truck assembly i actually have all of those fems or those finite element models from some of those results that we saw earlier now i could reuse those or create one brand new so let's actually create one brand new because i want to show off you know some of the options here that are available to you that that really help you know, automate some of these steps. So I could choose automatic. We could choose all geometries there and, and start setting this up. Um, but instead, I'm just going to choose none. And, and I want to break this down into a couple smaller building blocks with you, Jeremy, uh, just so that you can see kind of what's going on here. But keep in mind that there definitely are some automatic approaches here. Uh, to creating the, the finite element model and specifying some of these mesh and material properties. So that's it. Wait, it inserted a, a mesh. We can see it over there on the left hand side. There's our new mesh, finite elements. There's our new our new mesh that we're working with, but we don't see anything. Nothing's different here yet. Let me set up a couple other properties here as we move forward. Now to solve this, there's different study types available. And depending on the, the role that you have of, of Simulia, you can do different things all the way from a simple static analysis. That's what we're doing here, all the way up to explicit dynamics, complex frequency. I mean, the, it really opens the doors to, to some fantastic capabilities that we have leveraging that Abacus technology. So setting up the static step, um, we can specify time increments, that sort of deal, if we want to have that level of control. Of course, some of the default properties are there to be our friend as well. So as it starts going through the automatic solving process, um, it can automatically cut back and chop up our, our simulation into smaller pieces so that it can, it can solve it. So those two steps there, my setup is done. Let's continue moving on through the assistance. Um, we'll head on over to um, parts now. And when it... it um, loads up it's actually taking a look at our model and recognizing michael since you didn't choose those automatic <laughs> options earlier what do you want me to solve like that's what it's asking me right now so i can actually go through and pick and choose either on the the list on the left hand side there and, and we call these contributing shapes there you can see them so i can come in pick and choose you know the components of interest that i'm after so we'll get the, the top part bottom parts uh, we need one of these stops on the left and the right, and I think, I think that's about it. So, Michael, I notice in the model there, it looks like you actually have all the different versions of the bushings you're going to be working with in the model right there. That's just so you can. Are you grabbing all of those right now, or are you just grabbing one of them for this initial simulation? Good question. I just, um, I just grabbed one, and I'm going to jump over to SolidWorks to show you why I did this um, in a little bit. So you can take a look here as I was clicking through, a couple things happened already. Now, when I click the bottom mounting plate, it grabbed this thing it called an abstraction shape. This is just a little bit of foreshadowing here for you in terms of when it comes to simplifying the model. I'm going to ignore that abstraction shape here for a moment and just use the one that was created inside SolidWorks. So we'll leverage that one. Um, there you can see there's the, the rubber block material and similar thing has happened here with some of those uh, guide plates. So it's grabbing this abstraction shape. So I've done this in a couple areas and I'll, I'll talk about why in a moment. So there's our top, um, no abstraction shape there. We're using the one from SolidWorks and then our other guide plate there using the abstraction shape. So you can go through and dig through all these different, all these different parts and make sure that you're grabbing the correct body of the correct body that you want. And I should say, you know, if you have a multi-body part, same situation here. You can go in and pick and choose which bodies uh, that you that you want. All right, so I still have all these other components showing here. There's this really cool tool, visualization management. It's really cool, and it's I use it all the time because it it really makes it easy to visualize 
you know, to, to show what you want to show. If it's the, the shape, the finite element model, the connections, the results. So one level more here is I can actually change this to contributing. So this automatically hides all those bodies that we're not solving for. That's pretty cool. You know, uh, in Shop Floor Programmer, uh, they have a similar filter thing that you can do in the action pad where you can be like, I don't want to see the stock material. I don't want to see the tool paths or I do. So it looks like a lot of continuity between uh, these different apps that we get from some of these other, you know, these really powerful tools. So I, I find that like really interesting that it works the same way over there. Okay, we're going to jump back to SolidWorks here in a moment. Taking a look at that top plate, I flipped it over, so now it's kind of the bottom, I guess. <laughs> uh, but you can see it's pretty simplified. Like, we don't have those mounting holes that you would expect to have. And actually, I, I, the reason for that is because I did the simplification of this model inside SolidWorks. But you can see here, there's a level of simplification that I still need to do. Let me I flipped it back over. So the bottom uh, mounting plate here, actually has a lot of these small holes, fillets, some, some recessed cuts. That's going to cost me a finer mesh, which means it's going to take longer to solve. It's going to take more computational horsepower to be able to solve this study. So I want, it, I want this to be fast. I want it to be quick. And you know, thinking about what we're solving here, the compression of that you know, rubber bushing is, I don't need those finer details for this study. So let's get rid of them. Let's you know, put that level of detail off. So let's switch back to SOLIDWORKS here for a moment um, and take a look at that, that top plate. And what we did here inside SOLIDWORKS, there's you know, definitely direct editing capabilities so that you don't have to go back in and suppress features. Um, and that's what I did here. So I actually used delete face. Let me suppress that so you can see some of the uh, level of features that are in this model. And of course, you know, for, there is a fillet, we suppress that, but a single command, delete face, was used to get rid of all of that um, unnecessary geometry in this case. So let's ask the chat that question. How many, how many people in the chat have used delete face for making variations on their model? I think this is a really cool example, Michael, of where you wanted a very different version of your, of your part. In delete face, a single feature allowed you to not clutter up your feature manager tree and quickly get rid of all that stuff. So give us a one in the chat if you use the delete face tool for getting rid of features and things like that. And I should mention if, you know, as a SOLIDWORKS user, right click on your command manager, go to tabs and turn on direct editing. So this is a great collection of tools these tools are readily available, you know, elsewhere in the software, but this is, this collects it right there for you, uh, so that you can go in. You can use move face, move copy bodies, delete bodies, delete face, split parts out. Some excellent collection of tools for for performing those tasks. Now, I don't want to steal the thunder from Mike Sandy, who's going to be one of our future presenters, <laughs> because he's he's really going to be focusing in on SolidWorks models, especially large complex models and simplifying them and preparing them for simulation. So that's enough for SOLIDWORKS for me right now on the simplification. Well, hold, hold, on, hold on, Michael, I wanna, so before we go any further, can you stay in SOLIDWORKS a minute? Can you show the assembly that we're working with that has that bushing in it? So are we, just so I know, I don't know where, we're, where you're going with this, are we gonna be looking at multi, all those different versions you showed us? There was like uh, four of them, right? Oh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I'm so ready to get into that simulation. I wanna ask the chat which version they think is gonna perform the best here. Can we open that up and go through those different versions and ask the chat, like, Tell us like what 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 bushing will probably perform the best, or is that not like kind of how we're doing the simulation? I may be asking a question that we're not actually going to cover. Yeah, well, see, and, and you know, I would ask what what do you mean by best? Like what right. constitutes the best design? Mm -hmm. Earlier, I was talking about you know having a configurable experience. Right. So maybe we can put it this way: which configuration, other than this block one, because the block one's kind of a giveaway. Which one is going to provide the most resistance to the writer? Yeah, let's ask that question. Let's pull that up and then let's ask the chat which one's going to provide the most resistance to the writer. So we have this, I, I call it like the, the B configuration because it has this B in there. Yep. The other thing that's really tricky about this one 
is once we get to a certain point, you can kind of see how this part's going to fold in on itself and we're going to have some self-contact. Yeah. What's going to happen when that happens? Okay, so think, you know, think of that. So that'll be option B. We'll call that option B. <laughs> yeah. So option A is the is the block. Yep. Option A is the the static block. Uh -oh. That is that is not a valid entry in uh, in our question here. Okay. Option B is the B cut. Yep. And option C is the C cut. All right. <laughs> Which one provides the so most B or resistance? C. So we're gonna ask them B or C. Which one's gonna provide more resistance, B or C? right and and albin m asked can we bet i don't think they're doing an over under on FanDuel for this solidworks live but maybe next time <laughs> okay all right so while the votes come in yeah um let's see well jeremy was there anything else that you want to take a look at in the no, I, no I just i wanted to i was curious like what the uh what the chat was gonna think uh about this all right all right, so let's talk about uh, a little bit more about how this is set up. So again, we're, we're back to the, the assistant in this case. We've set up contributing shapes. We can get into model. We're still on this topic though of, of simplification. So that, that bottom mounting plate, let's take a look at what this looks like. We have some model preparation tools. And again, they're collected in one location there, right at the bottom. So here you can actually see where we're going to be getting into results. We're going to be getting into the, how we're setting up the scenario. And then we have all of these model preparation tools. So defining the model, defining the mesh, and model prep. So this is where we're going to be able to simplify the geometry. So when I launch this, it asks me, what do you want to do? You could actually specify a target shape. And actually, you can see a little notification on the top right. It's like, hey, hey, this model was created in SolidWorks. If you want to modify it, go to SolidWorks. And we already did that for one case. But you know, in this case, I want to do the simplification right inside the simulation tool. So what we do instead is create an abstraction shape. And um, I pick the model right from here. So it's going to create that abstraction shape as a reference. So I'll hit OK here. And there you can see over here in the tree, let's see, this is my original abstraction shape. There's the source model from SolidWorks. Here's what I just made automatically. So let's get into a little bit of what this looks like because right now it's empty, right? It, it hit it. But what I can do is I can grab the solid model, I can copy it, and I can paste special directly into that part body model. Now there's this really cool option down here. When I do this paste special, is it going to be as result with link or as result? Big difference. And this is where we're leveraging, again, the power of the connectivity and the associativity of these apps is when I choose as result with link, that means that when the SolidWorks model is changed, my abstraction shape is going to update automatically. It's going to update with that link. Pretty cool. So this huh? is kind of like uh, <laughs> insert body almost inside of SolidWorks. Right? Yeah, insert part is body. You have or an external reference. Body, yeah. Yep, you have an external reference. That's very similar. All right, so let's get into some of the simplification activities here. Um, now that I'm in this you know, part preparation, I have a new collection of tools there at the bottom. And right there, similar to what we saw in SOLIDWORKS, we have D feature, we've got some delete face, we have some move face, and this one, this is the, the big joy feature here, is D featuring. We have something similar in, in SOLIDWORKS for you know automating some D featuring steps, but this one's really, really cool. All right, so we have different filters that we can apply. So let's start out with some fillets. Maybe we want to get rid of all those fillets here in the model. Well, sure enough, we can. So I create a fillet feature. In this case, I specify a, a maximum radius. So I don't know, 10 might be too big. Let's just click OK, and I can choose preview there. So it actually highlights in the model everything that it's going to turn off. And that looks like it's getting rid of an appropriate level of mounted detail. So let's go one step further here. Um, we want to get rid of those holes. Now you can see that this part already has some existing holes in there, so we want to be mindful over the maximum radius that we're defining here. So let's try eight. You know, I could go in and measure this. Let's just guess here. I've done this before, so it was eight a good number? No. What I do here? Oh, you know what I did? 
I did the fill uh, the fill it filter it again. again. Right? Ah, okay. Hole filter. There we go. Maximum diameter. Let's do eight. Now, Michael, when you're doing this, can you choose holes that you don't want it to defeature away, or is or does this tool specific, or would you use delete face if that was the case? I, I would use because this is doing a, a global instance. Okay. Yep. Um, it's doing a global scan of the model and it's going to follow these filters to do it. So that's where, yeah, I would use a different tool set there if you're wanting to keep other geometry. Like if there's two holes of the same size, you want to keep one but not the other, use delete face. All right, so what I'm left here are these little pockets. So what I can do with these pockets here is we'll use, you know, remove face here to kind of go through and, you know, grab grab a collection of these. So, you know, this is similar to what was done inside SOLIDWORKS. So, and again, we're, we're leveraging the same SOLIDWORKS model as we're doing this. In this case, though, we're modifying an abstraction shape. So the changes I'm making here, this is, again, if you're wanting to not have to worry about adding additional configurations to your SOLIDWORKS model, this is probably a, this is a great solution for preserving that SOLIDWORKS model because you're not making changes to the SOLIDWORKS model. So wherever it's used in drawings or other downstream efforts, it's that same high fidelity model. The changes I'm making here are to this abstraction shape. Yeah, so this is kind of like um, a, a bit of a, of a analogy. It's kind of like uh, doing uh, non-destructive photo editing in Photoshop, right? Like you always preserve the original data and you don't actually make any changes to the original data. I really like that. I mean, those and those tools are basically what you were doing in SOLIDWORKS anyway. Yeah, yep, yeah. that's right. All right, so let's take a look now. Um, we've specified our, our contributing shapes. Um, I'm gonna jump forward here um, to the mesh a little bit because I wanna get into some properties. I'm gonna get into um, some, some meshing here. Uh, as we get in, so I'm, I'm, I'm jumping. I'm jumping forward right now. No, it tells me I'm sure enough incomplete. There's zero of five components that we want to mesh. So, if you're familiar with SolidWorks simulation, you're familiar with a uh, tetrahedral mesh, and I can just initialize from geometry and and mesh these components out. So again, because we did some simplification here, it's giving us a rather coarse mesh. It's not having to do any level of refinement, and that's that's perfectly fine here. So I'm going to keep that. We're gonna do this again for the, um, oh, you know what? Our bottom component as well. I do need to jump back here to parts because I need to turn on that abstraction shape at the bottom. There we go. Did the chat catch me? No one caught me out of five components, right? My mesh said, hey, you have five components, but how <laughs> many do I actually have? It's like, Michael, no, you should have six. Well, sure enough. Yeah, okay, now I have six. All right. So, so now, hey, I just want to give you a heads up, Michael. It is uh, looking close. I see one, two, three C's. I see two B's, three B's. So it's right. tied. But Tom Kelly has the tie-breaking boat with an F. So I don't know, Tom, if you want to <laughs> reconsider. I'm just saying, right now you got that. Somebody's got to make the tie-breaking boat. Oh, I just saw a new another good, great question come up. How can we check mesh quality? I previewed it earlier with the web-based app uh, to look at the mesh quality, you know, color codes, these elements. And actually, I'll, I'll get in there in just a moment. It's right down here on my process uh, that we're going to do. But the instead of a tet mesh for these other components, we're going to do a sweep 3D mesh. So we're actually getting into brick elements. This is this, I mean, especially coming from solver simulation. This is fantastic. Um, to do this, you know, I can pick a component. It automatically picks the the, the two faces that it's going to sweep through or from and to. So we can specify how many layers we want, what's the mesh size that we want. So I can, you know, tighten this down as we see fit. That looks okay. Similarly, we'll grab the other one. And now this isn't a type of mesh that you can use in uh, that you have available to you in SOLIDWORKS desktop simulation, correct? Correct. We do not have the, this type of mesh in desktop SOLIDWORKS. And this is really one of the reasons why we're able to go you know, further beyond in the types of complexity and the types of physics that we're solving um, with these Simuli apps. Like in this case, we're getting into the compressibility of rubber. 
Like, so when we do a sweep through, you know, our rubber bushing here, you know, I can, I can really specify that what I should say is this type of mesh is much better suited for these nonlinear materials. All right, so let's tighten this one up a little bit more here. So, and the other thing you may notice here with the sweep, the sweep 3D mesh, it's very quick. Yeah, it's like instantaneous. Like you make an adjustment and hit mesh, it's like right there. There's no like calculating bar or anything like that. I noticed that. All right, so no one else caught me on my other math mistake. So when I said five earlier, five was the correct answer. <laughs> and I just meshed five parts. So why why am I seeing six? Yeah, what's the sixth part? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to go back to contributing shapes. You know, if we take a look back down um, at these, I did have my original SolidWorks model still picked. We don't need that one. We'll turn that one. Because you have the abstraction of it now. Because I have the abstraction of it now. That's exactly right. So now that I've done that, look at this. Oh. Got, got to get that instant feedback there. Green check mark <laughs> with my mesh. This is looking good. Okay. Parts. Now we can move forward here. Um, do a couple other things. Oh, but I should mention, um, with defining the materials here, um, all of these different objects have properties. So, and we can do this with a couple different ways. I'm going to keep it simple here, but maybe for an advanced topic, we can get into some of these advanced properties for like shells and beams. In this study, we're just going to be using, you know, 3D solid uh, sections um, for defining this. All right. So, let me just hide my mesh here for a moment. We'll just show those contributing shapes. And since four of the five are going to be the same properties. I can actually define one solid section property for all of these. Now, what's my material going to be? Well, this is where we can use the material palette. Material palette's pretty great. Uh, we can use this to, you know, search and refine um, our materials. I've got 415 materials in here. You know, rather than having to sort through all of the, the various ones, let's just do what I have in session, right? Right in, in that other study. So there I have the two types of rubbers that we you know, or can compare against. And um, you know, what's the difference between those? I can actually select the two of them and we can compare them right here. So now you can see the difference. Density is the same, but my C10 is higher. My C01 is also a little bit higher, but same compressibility factor there. So a great, great easy way to compare materials with that material palette. Okay. So, so Michael, you're telling me we tricked the chat. We asked them which shape was more resistant, but the reality oh. is, is the material could that's, actually be also playing a factor here. That's that's definitely question two. Uh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. All right. So even though we're doing a static analysis, I can, um, I can include some plasticity behavior. I know I'm not going to be getting close to that. Um, you know, with the, the with these materials. So I'm gonna choose without plasticity here. It's actually gonna reduce the complexity, speed up my analysis here a little bit. Um, we do need to set up uh, other properties here for that rubber material. So this is where, you know, maybe we can have the chat decide which, which rubber material do we want, the 45 or the 60? Let's do that. So, what uh, what were the diff what were the differences on these again? One was one just had a the sixty had a little bit higher of some of the values. Right. Now, Michael, I don't know what C ten and C O one mean. What do those mean in a simulation world? These are the material properties for the M Mooney Rivlin material model. I'm going to save okay. that for another discussion another time. Yeah. So let's let the chat really quick. First one to jump in, type in 45 or 60. They're going to choose our material. We'll give them just a couple seconds here. I know that there's a delay between when the stream goes out and when the chat can react to those. So we're really looking for somebody to choose the material we're going to use here, the HNBR45 or HNBR60. First one that types that in the chat, you're going to define our study for us. I feel like we need the Jeopardy, uh, the end music right here. Yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> because I know that there is a delay from when we're going to get it versus uh, when the answer is going to come in here. By the way, uh, Eric cast the tie-breaking vote on the shape uh, with B. He chose B as the shape to be most resistant. The 60. There we go, the 60. Okay, I was guessing. I like. I chose Thanks 45. For saying, so let me go back. I'm going to change it to 60. All right, the other thing I'm going to mention here is with this material palette, like if you're working in a multi-team environment, you know, we talked a little bit about the collaboration earlier. Uh, it, 3D Experience Platform, ideal for this collaborative environment as well. That material pal that I'm pulling from, it's the same materials that everyone in the organization has. So if it, you know, a change is made to those properties, new materials are added, they're instantly available for everyone. All right, so getting into um, connections and interactions. So one thing's gonna be interesting here, Jeremy, is we know there's a bolt that goes through all of these components. I'm going to ignore that bolt and I'm going to use some restraints for that instead. So really in this case, everything's kind of free floating. How are they going to interact? That's really my question here. So let me, I can skip uh, connections here. Those red circles mean that um, they're optional. So, but they're, they're, they're incomplete, but I don't necessarily need to complete them. So the material property here is, uh, or the, the interactions that we're defining here, we can specify a contact property. This is where we're specify the tangent behavior here. So a friction coefficients, uh, let's do about 0.2. Some other options in here, definitely some things for a separate discussion, but the other default values are gonna work just fine for me in this case. So the, what I just did there, Jeremy, is just a contact property. What's my friction coefficients? You know, there's some, there's always some, you know, fun physics problems out there of like, remember from your physics class, like, here's the physics problem and you can ignore friction. You're like, yay, I can ignore <laughs> friction, but there's friction in the real world. So, yeah, I set up a contact property to include friction. But how is that defined at all the areas of where things come and interact? This is one of the biggest, most powerful features, general contact. And it's not necessarily a big feature in terms of the complexity, it's just how easy it is. I just set up that global contact <coughs> property of that friction coefficient of point two, and it's applying it automatically throughout. So it, the system, the software is automatically determining when and if things come into contact, what are their contact properties? And that's how it does it. Okay, let's step, move forward to restraints here. We're gonna do a clamp at the bottom We'll hold that in and we can do a fixed displacement here um, at our um, holes. And, you know, I can zoom in here and select, you know, Jeremy, I know you're a big fan of this is, um, you know, if there's any geometry that you can't see. Select how you, other. How do you select other? So here I can hold alt on the keyboard and click and that gives me my select other list here. So I can grab that cylindrical nice. face there right in the middle um, and do that. All right, take a look at my triad in the bottom left or my robot. This is letting me know that my Z axis is my rotating axis. <laughs> I even have an on-screen display there as well, uh, right where at my selection. So I wanna make sure that I do not constrain rotation in the Z axis. Um, and in this case, yeah, translation wise, I think, you know, things can translate along that Z axis as well. Cause remember here, we're holding um, firm the bottom um, uh, there. So we can allow things to rotate about Z and let things uh, translate along Z, yeah. So how are we controlling the kind of rotation? Uh, what's going on at the top? Cause this, this top one is uh, more or less free floating now. Uh, with the exception of those cylindrical faces. Um, and we'll do this uh, with a, a uh, let's look here. <laughs> Eric, Eric Beatty says friction has always rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how, how are we doing on time, Jeremy? Because I know we have about 10 minutes left, but we can go over a little bit if we need to. Okay. I'll try, I'll try to stop interrupting you. Sorry, Sorry. I'm like super intrigued here. 
And I'll tell you what, for the, the last piece of the thing, just to, to save some of the, the picks and clicks, I'm going to go through kind of the, the setup that I've already done. So here you can see actually some of the, the setup work that was done, because there's a couple other things that I wanted to do. There's this amplitude definition, um, and there's the restraints that I was just talking about. But otherwise, everything else is the same. There's our static step. There's our uh, we're, we're going to talk about our load in the interact in the amplitude here in a little bit. OK, so our restraints here. One thing that was done we had actually I did a little bit differently in this one. We had a hinge. Let me come here to my visualization management. Make sure that we are showing our those contributing shapes, our connections. And scenario we will go ahead and show great. So our hinge, actually I did set up a little bit different for that top. I set up a hinge connection. So that's where we're at. I did. I did constrain the Z translation uh, for that top component there. Fixed displacement on the other um, entities and on that rubber block. For our interactions, those were the same. For our loads though, I did an applied rotation. So let me double click this to open it up. Because this is applied to, and I didn't cover this earlier, but there is a coupling that I defined at the top. So this coupling is defined in the model. The reason why we define that, and so that's earlier um, in our model setup, why we do a coupling is that makes it easy to get that force feedback. So this is how we're going to be able to answer that question in a timely fashion here is by looking at that um, at that curve on that coupling from the applied rotation. So we're rotating this 15 degrees. And the amplitude here, the thing to notice is how fast am I applying this load? So a very important piece here, especially in a static analysis, because in a static analysis, right, you're usually just going from zero to 100 and depending on how fast it can converge on that. So with this tabular amplitude we've specified, we're going to ramp up from zero to one. Specifically, we're, we're defining this fact, zero to one. So it's not gonna be, if it, if it takes a slice at 0 0.1, it's not going to be one, it's gonna be 0 0.1. So we've defined this linear curve uh, for, this, for this load. That's how we're controlling and making sure that it's going to be consistent as it slices through the analysis. OK, so at this point, Jeremy, I think we can start getting into um, po processing um, some of these results. Uh, so I'm just going to, to switch over here and visualize um, uh, what we have here. So this is our, our block that we took a look at earlier. Yeah. And I'm going to just animate this. Because you can see one reason the block was just kind of that initial prototype block, but a couple of other things are happening here. Ooh, it's, yeah, it's pushing that other part kind of out of the way as it deforms. Yeah, I mean, as, it's, as we're compressing it, it's, of course, pushing out, expanding at the sides, and it's creating, you know, definitely an issue here. We don't want to use this solid block. It's, no. this is, you know, like Eric mentions, we're going to have more contact, more friction. It's going to rub the rider the wrong way for sure. <laughs> now, to get a result like that, that's not a result you could actually get in SolidWorks desktop simulation, could you? Where it would deform and push another part out of the way like that? Not without a lot more setup and and, and effort to go in and, and setting that up. And you yeah, just set a you just set the con the global what was it the global contact and that kind of took care of all of this the global contact is what took care of that right because it's automatically detecting that it's coming in contact right even how it's pushing out there and coming in contact with the other other components or that that guide plate Very so cool. yeah okay so there's a a variety of different plots here that we have access to and that we can create. And there's a few different ways to, to toggle through these. Right on the right hand side here, we can take a look at what step we're solving for. We can take a look at, you know, that either, you know, von Mises stress in the model that we were looking at. We can take a look at the contact pressure that's being, you know, recognized there between components. And of course, we saw my mesh earlier, it was rather coarse. So this looks like a lot, but it's, and, and it is, I mean, we're, we're exceeding, exceeding one megapascal. I'm here, but I, uh, probing over these areas, about half a Pascal. So yeah, 
that's quite a bit of pressure that's going on there. Um, but when it comes to the, the rubber, the compressibility, we're looking at the uh, the strain in that material. Well, okay, that's pretty, pretty good. Uh, we saw some of those results earlier, but how about um, uh, that reaction moment of what's going on here? So let's bring this one up. Here's, here's our reaction moment um, of just the block. So we're coming upwards here right at the top. I mean, we're at almost two Newton meters, 1.9. So that's kind of our baseline, right? To, to think okay. of uh, as we compare these. All right, are we ready to get our next answer? So, okay, answer B, what do we think? So we had B as the winner. Uh, that's what the people guessed. So now you want us to guess uh, like what the results are? Well, so do you think it's gonna be stiffer or less stiff than A? Which I no think one it will be about. less stiff than I, A. I think it will be less stiff as well. And here's where, you know, this is the same study. I'm actually uh, hiding all of my other components here. We can just easily restore restore all of those uh, so you can see what kind of what's going on here. But the reason why I was hiding some of those is you can see, see how this one comes into some self-contact there. Michael, there's a question. Uh, can you increase the rotation constraint? Like when you were, I'm assuming they're <laughs> referring to when you set up the uh, the hinge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So hold on, because I I need, I need to answer this. I wanted to. Uh, if you've seen the rest of the Shredder story, there's there's a lesson to be learned, because <laughs> there is a hard stop ah. in the metal that's defined here. So we so want to be very careful if we increase that too far. There is a hard stop that's definitely beyond what I was out to solve in this study. Right, so that's kind of like why you were defined at 15 degrees right there, it's because there was a hard stop that was gonna stop it from moving anyway at that point. Correct. Uh, somebody's also asking if you added any weldments uh, in the part, would it make issues with the mesh in the simulation with weldments? Now that question could be answered two ways, right? Michael, you have from a modeling perspective, but you also have from a real world perspective. I'm not sure what they're trying to. Oh, if things were welded together, is that the question? Yeah. Like if we have, so in this case, there's, um, these were cast parts. So there's no welds in these parts at all. Um, we did eliminate the fillets um, in, you know, in the those cast parts, just to simplify it for the, simpl uh, for the simulation. But otherwise, they, they're they're cast parts, so things aren't welded here for like those different uh, those different mounting points. Yeah, but if they were welded together, um, you can have you know similar to what we would do in SolidWorks simulation to have those different connectors, weld connectors uh, that we can define here as well. Fair enough. We're, we're getting we're getting we got another vote for B. For okay, well, B. I I think but that came in after they saw the results, so I don't know if we can accept that vote at this point. All right, so just that pure block of rubber was 1.9 Newton meters. Yeah. This one is 0.215. Now, uh, I don't, what a huge difference. Right. Well, we've eliminated a lot of material here, but there, you know, we can we can start to see. So, what was the number? What do you What do you mean the number of votes? No, what was the uh, amount of rotation? It was 15 degrees, right? Yeah, that's what you're talking about, right? How far it rotated? No, 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 the, the amount oh. of the Newton meters, 0.215. That's the number. I got to write this down. I got to grab a pen. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to have to. Uh... Here, chat, can you keep, uh, keep a note for me? <laughs> 0 0.25, 0 0.25, right? 0 0.225, right? 0.215 Newton meters. 0.215 Newton meters. And the other, the original one was what? It was 0.1? 1. 1. 1? 1. 1.9. 1.9. B. All right, let's see C. All right. Well, first, I mean, let's just uh, let's enjoy the animation for a moment. Okay, looking good. All right, now let's uh, let's show our reaction here. Point one zero one. So B is point the two one five. But it's interesting, right? It, the, the curves um, made it had a similar kind of slope to them, or similar uh, similar style um, of curve. Just one's higher than the other. 
And what, what I thought was most interesting about this, I mean, we come back here to, to this, this one here, the B. So, well, first off, congratulations to our winners. You <laughs> made the correct choice of B. Your prize is the confidence that you used some, uh, you made a good choice. You made your, a good 50-50% choice. Your correct hypothesis will be recorded in the history of the YouTube chat. That's correct. <laughs> So what was interesting here is like, even though this came into self-contact, it added very little or negligible um, amounts of, of feedback. So it's kind of really interesting. I, I was surprised by that when I got this result myself, where, you know, I was expecting a different ramp up and curve, you know, especially we would definitely see that if we did continue that rotation into the steel, maybe that'll be a bonus for next time when I come back and do durability of it, what would happen if we rotated it more than 15 degrees. <laughs> We can answer that question, sure enough. So, so there we have our answer. You know, one thing I, I didn't get into is, you know, we talked about material properties earlier. I did create additional, you know, studies here um, to compare, uh, you know, what would happen between not only the geometry but the materials as well. And we can create um, these comparison layouts um, of all of these, you know, components, all these materials um, of interest and view them you know, simultaneously in, in one view. So here you can see, you know, we're taking a look at the strain in the materials, uh, you know, between the two different types of materials at the top. Very uh, similar, um, you know, results here. However, in the bottom, that B, we are getting more strain in, in one of our materials. So that's, uh, I think that's the 45. So that's very interesting you know, to, to get that feedback, to help make our decisions and which designs that we want to move forward with. In this case, you know, which materials that we may want to use for these different configurations for the customer and the rider of, of the shredder. So kind of going back here, you know, we can review, you know, the, the mesh, we can review the simulation results all on the clouds. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still remembering that question earlier. Can you check the mesh quality here? Sure enough, we can do that on cloud. We can do it um, inside the simulation app that we were spending most of our time in today. So I think, you know, Jeremy, we, we're setting the shredder up for even some more success here as we as we continue to work on, on this design. Yeah, this is great, uh, Michael. This was really cool. Very eye-opening for me. Um, if people want to learn more about either you know uh this uh the simulia tools you were using today or the shredder story uh we we have a, a link in the comments right there's a, there's a link in the description that um, goes through the more complete story of the uh the shredder um talking about the design aspects of course some of the simulation that we saw here today just at a higher level overview um we get into the manufacturing of the of the shredder as well so very, very cool. Yeah, we're going to be talking about that next week if you're interested in. So if you go watch that story, uh, we show a really cool product in there called Shop Floor Programmer. We're going to be discussing that next week. on. So next week is SolidWorks Live at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Thursday. I'm going to be hosting that with guests Michael Buckley and John Milbury. We're going to be talking about CNC machining on the clouds as well. So... Uh, I, I just did that back to you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and then um, well, I'm going to be back um, talking about fatigue in a few live design sessions. Uh, so this kind of you know answers the question. Okay, especially in a case like this, we have some stresses and strains inside some of these mechanisms. Uh, but you're not just going to ride the shredder once. You're going to ride it multiple times. How many times can you maybe, ride maybe it? Maybe you, Michael. I, if I ride it, I'm riding it once. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, how long will it last? I mean, can we design for the life of some of these parts? And sure enough, we can. You can make those design decisions to, you know, increase the life, increase the durability um, of these components so that you just make a higher quality product um, for your customer. Well, cool, Michael. I want to thank you so much for joining us here today on Live Design. This was uh, this was really cool to see how you were able to do this. I hope the chat really enjoyed getting involved in the conversation here. 
live design uh, will be coming. Uh, you, we just mentioned we're going to have SolidWorks Live next Thursday. In two Thursdays, I'm going to be joined. Am I hosting this? So that's another thing we should point out. Michael, I think you're going to be hosting some of these. We're, we're really mixing up SolidWorks Live. It looks like it's me on the schedule with Mark Peterson. Mark is going to be joining us for some home office improvement. He's going to be showing how to uh, design for 3D printing. I think that'll be really cool. Some uh, some things to improve your home office, actually. And then it'll be after that one. Is it Mike Sandy? No, it's uh, Brad Williamson. He's Brad Williamson's designing coming. Designing and drumming. So Brad is a musician on our team. He's going to combine both of his passions, engineering and drumming. I can't wait to see what that's about. And then we, yeah, we're going to Mike Sandy uh, pre-processing for simulation on April 22nd. Yeah, so we have a huge That's schedule. a key one because, you know, I, I covered some of the Simulia tools for pre-processing the model to simplify it for simulation. Mike Sandy is going to be using some more of those SolidWorks tools and addressing some of these large assembly and complexity factors to simplify those models for simulation. That's going to be a great one. All right. Well, stay tuned if you want to catch another SolidWorks Live design, SolidWorks Live, or exploring 3D Experience Works. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit the bell notification icon so when we go live, you can join us and uh, keep posting your questions if you have anything you want to see in the future. Until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jeremy.